Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to tonight's stream. My name is Kyle. I'm with High Point Scientific, and tonight you're looking at a live view of the constellation of Orion, and within the constellation of Orion, the Great Orion Nebula, Messier 42. This is by far one of the brightest and best nebula that you can see in the sky right now, especially for those in the Northern Hemisphere. Tonight we're going to be taking your questions about astronomy in the nighttime sky, as well as sharing with you guys a bunch of different really cool, beautiful celestial objects in the sky. Now tonight I'm using the Apertura 72 uh, millimeter f6 double refractor for my main imaging telescope and I'm imaging with the ZWO 183 MC Pro camera uh, with this I'm using a Optolong L enhanced filter this filter is designed primarily for emission nebula now the Orion nebula is a bit of a emission and a reflection nebula but um, we're focusing primarily on emission tonight looks like either a some fog or something might be passing in front of the image now because I just noticed a dramatic drop off in quality. But regardless, uh, you are still looking at great views of the Orion Nebula. So one thing I love to do during these live streams is I love to see where people are checking in from the world. So do me a favor and in the comments, check us, check, uh, let us know where you're viewing from and I'll be more than happy to give you a shout out. I love talking to such a wide, diverse range of audiences. I uh, saw a question though really quick coming up. What's the difference between a reflection and an emission nebula? And that is a fantastic question. Thank you so much for asking it. So an emission nebula is basically a region of highly ionized hydrogen alpha gas. And a reflection nebula is something like a nebula reflect that is lit by the reflection of a star, for example. Uh, a good example of an emission nebula would be the horsehead nebula. But a good example of a reflection nebula or a broadband object would be the uh, Pleiades, for example. We have Bob checking in from Rockland County, New York. Jill uh, checking in from Prescott, Ontario. We have Chris from New Jersey. Uh, Blake and Sue checking in from Rockford, Illinois. So the Orion Nebula is not a diffused nebula, it is a reflection and a emission nebula, both. So I'm just looking at the emission portion of the Orion Nebula tonight. Uh, we have a great um, video that just came out on our YouTube channel explaining uh, different types of filters. And in that filter video, we go into a little bit about how emission nebulas work. And I'm imaging from a Bortle 7 zone tonight. So for those who aren't familiar with the Bortle scale, um, the Bortle scale is basically a scale from 1 to 9, and if you're at a Bortle 1 location, you basically have perfectly dark skies. Let's say you're out in the middle of the ocean, and if you're in a Bortle 9 zone, you're basically dead in the middle of the city. So right now I'm about a Bortle 6, Bortle 7 zone, so pretty bright, and we're still getting a lot of transmission of nebulosity. We have Josh checking in from Grand Rapids, Michigan. My folks are from there. We have Kathy checking in from Lakeland, Florida. That's exactly where this stream is being hosted. Isabel wants to know, why do things in space make specific shapes like the Horsehead Nebula? And that is a great question. 
And to answer it is, it's entirely coincidence. It just happens that the horse head looks very much like a horse. And Orion very much looks like a hunter. But if you look at some of these constellations in the nighttime sky, you'll kind of stare at it for a few minutes and ask yourself, is this really an archer, for example, in the case of Sagittarius? It's a, uh, or in the con case of the constellation of, of Cancer, which is supposed to represent a crab, all you can really see is like a straight, like two bright stars, and you can just essentially draw a straight line between the two. And that is supposedly a crab. So to answer your question, they don't necessarily always take on specific shapes, just some things happen to take on a specific shape, and it's kind of cool. Uh, the Witch Head Nebula would be amazing, but unfortunately tonight that is a broadband object and we're only focusing on emission because I'm using a narrowband filter tonight. But that would be a great suggestion. If that was at a dark sky site, that would be perfect. Really quick fun fact about the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is located about 1,400 light years away from the Earth. You'll hear me in the stream talk a lot about light years and what's the difference between like a light year and an astronomical unit. And basically a light year is how astronomers measure distance out there in the universe. It is the distance light travels in a single year. So when I say these objects are, for example, 1,400 light years away, you're looking at an object as it was 1,400 years ago. Now space, in space things move really, really slow. So the Orion Nebula hasn't changed that much in 1,400 years. But as you look further out into space, for example, uh, you look at different galaxies and stuff like that, you look further and further back into time, and a lot of these galaxies actually end up being redshifted due to the expansion of the universe. Uh, these, this redshift is extreme enough that a lot of these galaxies, the very edge of the observable universe, require an infrared telescope to actually be able to see. And that was why NASA recently launched the James Webb Space Telescope to be able to observe these distant galaxies. It's also really cool to think about some older stars on our Milky Way, for example, Betelgeuse might have gone supernova by now but the light from that supernova event has simply not reached us if it's already happened. So we're looking back in time, you're looking at stars that might not even exist anymore. And to me, that is by far one of the most amazing facts about the universe. Uh, Sean wanting to know, can you give us a brief overview of the advantages and disadvantage of color and mono cameras? That's a great question. So color cameras I like because I'm lazy. I like to get all of my data in all of this single time, but monochrome cameras have a distinct advantage in that they uh, can usually yield a higher quality image. But the downside is you have to take your color channels separately. So for example, your luminous channel, your red channel, your green channel, and your blue channel all need to be taken like separately, but with a one-shot color camera like I'm using tonight, uh, you can uh, take all of your color data at the same time at the expense of higher resolution. I'm totally okay with that because I'm a very lazy astronomer and I like to go out and travel to dark sky sites, get as much information and data as I possibly can in a single go and get back to my place. So I hope that answers your question. One second, folks, I'll be back. I just got to deal with these spammers in the chat.
Alrighty, Kyle, you're back again, and I think we've looked at the Orion Nebula for quite a long time already, so we've been streaming for, I think, 10 minutes or so. So let's go ahead and switch on over to another object in the nighttime sky, and that's going to be the Horsehead Nebula. So while I do that, I'll take you with me on this journey uh, as I go to the next object in the nighttime sky and share with you my views of the software that I'm using, and that is a program called Nina. And Nina is a fantastic piece of free software that any astrophotographer can use. It is my bread and butter when it comes to imaging and is super useful because you can do things like connect your camera, cool down your camera sensor, connect your filter wheels, connect your focuser, your telescope. I'm using a program called Celestron PWI to actually control my telescope and I'm controlling that through Nina. I have my guiding. And if you're an astrophotographer, this all probably might sound completely alien to you. But this is just a bunch of stuff that enables me to automate my astrophotography so that I can do all of my astrophotography from the comfort of my own home. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to pull up our framing tool here. And we have a nice framing of the constellation, or excuse me, the Orion Nebula. But what we're going to do is we're going to search for Barnard 33. I believe that's the name of Horsehead. We're going to click that and then we're going to load our image. And so what I'm going to do is basically have my telescope do what's called plate solving. So looking at a bunch of stars in the image and then synchronize that view to this view we're seeing here. So I would like to get a little bit of the flame in there as well. That looks really good. And so what I should be able to do, if it'll let me, uh, actually, I need a, I do believe I need to stop my imaging, so we're just going to cancel that. Framing. So we're just going to click slew and center. So what this is going to do is we're going to actually slew my telescope over to where it thinks the Horsehead Nebula is, and we're going to use plate solving to correct for any error in the pointing, and then we're going to recenter it all without me touching it. So super, super useful. So it's taking a quick 10 second exposure. Hopefully we're close. It's taking a quick preview image. Terrific. So we look to be in tolerance and that looked to have been good, a good plate solving. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to fire up a two second exposure. Don't let me, there it goes. And we'll just let that go for a few minutes. A lot to take in there if you're, an amp, if you're totally new to astrophotography, but this program is just so useful and I strongly, strongly recommend it for anybody looking to really advance their astrophotography. You can vaguely see the flame nebula starting to peek out there a little bit, as well as this bright star here. Strongly, strongly recommend this. Uh, Christopher wants to know, are you doing a live stack in Nina or are we just seeing individual frames? Uh, we're doing individual frames. I have yet to figure out how to do live stacking in Nina. I know it's possible, I just haven't set that up yet. Uh, Hogarth is pointing out that I'm using CPWI v2.35 and I should update. Uh, I will absolutely do that. I wasn't aware of the update yet. And again, we're shooting through what's called an L Enhance filter tonight. The L Enhance filter is a narrowband filter and the Horsehead Nebula is a emission nebula making it ideally suited for this filter. We're going to be mostly focused on emission nebula tonight. After this, we'll probably go to the Rosette Nebula. Uh, Ruth wanted to know, so to keep the image center, the telescope knows to move along as the night sky moves, and that is correct. I've already gone ahead and um, done 
a polar alignment and I've turned on my telescope mount and then mount itself knows where everything's located roughly in the sky. Plate solving just helps me narrow it down to be a lot more precise. Uh, Alan wanting to know, would an L Extreme filter be better? And it absolutely would be because the L Enhance is a seven uh, nanometer filter and the L Extreme is a three nanometer and the lower the, uh, the band pass, the better the transmissibility of hydrogen alpha. And there you go. That exposure has finished up. And we'll just go ahead and full screen that. And there is a live view of the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation of Orion, one of my favorites. And you can just barely see that little uh, notch there representing the Horsehead. Now, a larger telescope would obviously have a much better resolution and would be more easily able to capture the horse head itself. But for a 72 millimeter refractor telescope, this is really good. Now one thing astrophotographers like to do is they like to do a thing called stacking. So what they'll do is they'll take like 10 or 15 or even 100 long exposures and they'll stack them in a program like Pixinsight, for example. And when they do that, they increase what's called the SNR, or signal to noise ratio. The more stacks you get, the higher the signal, the lower the noise, thus the more detail you can resolve. Is the L-Extreme seven nanometers? I apologize if I was mistaken there. Uh, it was my understanding that the L-Extreme was three nanometers. Having never used it, though, I could be completely wrong. The L Enhance, I believe, is 7 nanometers, though. Once again, folks, I'm using the Apertura 72mm f6 double refractor. Absolutely fantastic telescope. I love using it. Um, the image quality speaks for itself. It's one of the best telescopes I've ever owned, and completely happy with this one and we're just taking a bunch of two minute exposures here. The camera tonight I'm using is the ZWO183MC Pro. Pretty small sensor, thus a pretty high crop factor, which is why we're not able to quite catch all of the Orion Nebula or the Horsehead Nebula. Really quickly, I want to draw your attention to something on the edge of the frame here. If you look closely, you might be able to see a glow on the right-hand side of the image. That's totally normal. That's just called amp glow. Uh, if you get a camera like this, these easily stack out with your dark frames and not a problem. But because we're just looking at unprocessed subs, we do have a bit of amp glow tonight. Other cameras, I believe the 533 MC Pro, um, do not have as much amp glow or actually any amp glow in that case but this is a uh, little bit of a lower end CMOS sensor oh, okay thank you Hogarth for the correction uh, the L ultimate which is coming out soon is three nanometers I knew three nanometers was in there somewhere Uh, Mike asking, that's a lot of signal for two minutes. Are you using a high gain? Uh, not terribly, a gain of 200, which is higher than I usually would image at, but not terribly higher. Mark wanting to know, how does one see beyond what we are currently viewing? Stronger telescope? Stronger in this case being larger aperture? Yes. If you get a larger telescope, you'll be able to increase the resolution capability of your image, thus the image quality will be significantly better. Once again, if you're just tuning in, you're looking at a live view of the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation of Orion. My name is Kyle. I'm with High Point Scientific, and I just want to take a minute to thank each and every one of you for tuning in tonight. It is an absolute joy to be able to interact with you guys, uh, learn more about astrophotography from you, and I hope you guys have been learning, uh, enjoying these views so far. 
if you do like the type of videos like this, these live streams, uh, do us a favor, go ahead and share uh, this with your friends and family, get the word out, get people excited about astronomy and the nighttime sky. It's what we love to do. Uh, what's that thin black stripe on the left of the image? That is a dead row of pixels. It is easily taken out with darks, but it is an annoyance nonetheless. Now, totally unrelated, but one thing that's really cool and one of the benefits about living in Central Florida is that we often get rocket launches. And as I was setting up for the stream tonight, I happened to catch a view of a rocket launch. Oops. And this was all the way from Lakeland. This was the CSG-2 mission. Uh, what we're seeing here is the rocket uh, completing what's called a boost back burn as it heads back to Cape Canaveral. This was just an hour and a half ago. I managed to quickly capture this with my uh, 135 millimeter and you can see the first stage going off in back towards Cape Canaveral as the second stage heads off into space. I have never seen a launch that clear this far away from the Cape so it was absolutely beautiful and man I was just not expecting it. Um, the lighting was just perfect and it was super cool to see completely unrelated to the live stream tonight but it was just something I really wanted to share with you guys it was so cool to see. Another comment I saw of asking is if I use a field flattener, and I do. I am using the uh, Apertura dedicated field flattener for this telescope. Absolutely essential for astrophotography. I see we have 133 people checking in on Facebook and I believe 48 people checking in on YouTube. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. It is so great to be able to talk to you. We'll be looking at a couple more objects tonight and I just wanted to thank you guys so much for uh, tuning in tonight. Uh, Dwight asking, why do you prefer a refractor or a reflector? I don't really have a preference. Refractors are, generally speaking, for me, easier to use. Again, I'm using the Apertura 72 millimeter doublet refractor. It's just a little easier for me to manage and then a Newtonian, especially with a Celestron AVX mount, which doesn't really have that great of a payload capacity for astrophotography. But uh, I just prefer refractors because it's just a little easier for me to use. Uh, reflectors have to do things like collimation and are prone to image shifting. Um, the collimation can shift throughout the night as the temperature changes and so on and so forth. And again, the mount I'm using, the uh, Celestron AVX mount tonight.
Question from Paul, and they're wanting to know, have astronomy apps learned to mask out the Starlink satellite based on predicted passes? Um, I'm not sure if I quite understand your question. If you're asking about whether or not apps um, predict Starlink satellite passes, they absolutely do. If you're as asking if there's a way for uh, ash photographers to be able to stack out Starlink satellites, there absolutely is. It's usually pretty easy to do. Uh, Joss wanting to know, do you think the AVX is the best mount in that price range? Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't, can't really answer that because, to be frank, the mount you get is the mount that, the mount you want to get is the mount that you think is going to work best for you. I use the AVX because it is a great grab and go. I can get it set up within a few minutes. I am looking to upgrade here very soon so that way I can maybe start using a Newtonian for these streams. But, um, to answer your question without without like a total cop out, I think it's a really good mount for the price that it is, and I'm very happy with it. Majo Alexander asking, is this a once in a lifetime view? No, it is not. Um, the one thing that's really nice about this stream, in my opinion, is that we're looking at things that you can see every night, most times of the year. And you can go outside right now if you have a telescope and a camera and you can take a long exposure of things like the Orion Nebula or the Andromeda Galaxy. No tracker needed or anything like that, just a simple tripod and you can actually point to these objects. Thank you so much for checking in tonight, Hogarth. Really appreciate uh, seeing you in the chat. Willow wanting to know, when would the Bale Juice supernova reach us after its observation given it happened? Um, did I say it happened? Uh, Bale Juice has not gone supernova yet, or at least we don't think it has. Now it's entirely possible it has, and the light simply hasn't reached us yet. But that is just, it has not, We Bale Juice has not gone supernova yet, but if it did, like let's say if it went supernova right now, it would take us how many light year, how, however many light years distant it is from the earth. I think it's like four or five hundred light years away from the earth. Uh, Mark wanting to know, when you say objects, do you mean these are all stars or suns? These are both stars and suns. Uh, the sun is a star. Um, you're looking at a very many number of suns here, um, at least over 100 that you can see in this image alone, and probably many more. Uh, Mike is shooting into Orion as I speak. That is awesome. I hope you get some good shots. Uh, Mike, uh, in the Facebook comments, is a fantastic astrophotographer and recommend checking out some of his pictures if you get the chance. Okay, so we've looked at Horsehead for quite a while now, so I think it's time to move on to our next object in the nighttime sky. That will be the Rosette Nebula. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel this frame, and I'll take you with me as I change to the next target. Oops. That was the rocket launch. Make that go away. There we go. So again, what I'm going to do is I've stopped my exposure here. I'm going to go over to framing, and then I'm going to search for the Rosette Nebula. If it pops up. And we're just going to load that up. And again, what we're doing is a process called plate solving. So we're just going to 
point the telescope to where it thinks the Rosette Nebula is, and then we're going to use a database of stars to be able to accurately pinpoint the exact location of the Rosette Nebula. Super useful feature called plate solving. Strongly recommend it. So all we're just going to do is we're just going to click slew and center. And what that's going to do it, again, it's going to point to the Rosette Nebula and hopefully it's within tolerance. If it is, there won't be any need to plate solve really. And again, the program I'm using to actually automate my astrophotography tonight is called NINA or Nighttime Imaging and Astronomy. I'm using one of the latest betas. Absolutely incredible tool. Sweet, so that has finished up. And what we're going to do is just increase the exposure time to about two minutes. So just give that a second. We'll let PhD2 settle. And then we're going to take our first two minute exposure. One thing I haven't checked tonight is I wanna check PhD2. This is the program I use to do what's called auto guiding with my telescope. And what this does is it will correct for tiny imperfections in the tracking to enable me to take longer exposures. My guiding tonight, you know, isn't the best for astrophotographers, but it is good for a Celestron AVX mount, given that's a lower end mount. I'm easily able to squeak out two to three minute exposures here, which is more than enough for my needs. So that is going good. Um, if looking close, I can see a little bit of backlash tonight, but nothing too serious. See, so yeah, I just about one minute left in that exposure. Question, where am I observing from? I am observing from just outside of Lakeland, Florida. Fairly light polluted zone, but this filter really helps me get all that hydrogen alpha data from these emission targets. So about 30 seconds to go. Mark wanting to know, how does one determine where one galaxy starts and another begin? That is a interesting question. Um, there's no set boundary to where a galaxy in, ends and like intergalactic space begins. Uh, generally speaking, there's like sort of a gradual tapering off of where there's just less galaxies You. So here is a image of the Rosette Nebula. I do have a little bit of trailing tonight. I'm wondering what caused that. Look at my page two graph here. Something happened right there. And there was a huge jump here. And that doesn't look like backlash or anything like that. So I don't know. <laughs> but here's a view of the Rosette Nebula. Uh, Mike wanting to know, have you s played with the settings on your graph? I have. This is just the one I'm most happy with. One thing I can clearly see in the Rosette Nebula, um, if you look closely, is I do see the vague hint of a skull. Some people call this the Skull Nebula. It is a fantastic treat for those to look and do some Halloween stargazing because it always uh, does vaguely resemble a skull.
saw a question pop up asking how far away the Rosette Nebula is, and you're looking at something that's 5,219 light years away from the Earth. So in a pretty incredible distance. Uh, Mike wanted to know how are you able to share your screen and broadcast live. I am using a program called TeamViewer to connect my PC to my astrophotography laptop. And then I'm using a program called OBS to be able to actually connect to both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Pat wanted to know what camera, please. I'm using the ZWO 183MC Pro camera. Rosette is pretty romantic, Sasha, I agree. Just in time for February. We'll have a bunch of more live streams coming up this year. I'm hoping to, fingers crossed, actually go out to Cape Canaveral in April or March or whenever this happens to, to live stream the first launch of NASA's SLS rocket. So, but we also have a bunch of live streams coming up like just like this. We'll be looking at some of the cool things you can see in the nighttime sky each month. So Scott asking how many time how often do I hold these live streams? I hold these live streams about once a month, sometimes more. In the past, we've done things like solar, like lunar eclipses and um, things like that, uh, meteor showers, new moon, full moon, super moons, uh, conjunctions, cool things like that. Mark wanting to know how would you determine if one of these lights might be a planet? The easiest way to determine it is if it moves against the background sky. Uh, all the stars in the nighttime sky move at what's called a uh, sidereal rate or a rate that basically matches the Earth's rotation. A planet over a course of a couple nights would appear to drift against the background. Planets are also extraordinarily bright. Hard to miss. I forgot to loop my images, silly me. David asking, what is my favorite nebula? My favorite nebula isn't technically a nebula, it's a galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. My favorite nebula, I guess, would be um, the Orion Nebula, probably, or the Horsehead. I uh, got a question asking, what's the learning curve on Nina? Steep, but not as steep as something like Pick and Sight, for example. Um, you just gotta really watch a few tutorials. I learned a lot from the YouTuber uh, called Quiv the Lazy Geek. You can find him on YouTube. He is a fantastic resource for amateur astrophotographers. I could not recommend his videos enough. He really helped me figure out how to use programs like Nina to the point where like, I couldn't see myself using anything else. So check out his YouTube channel, Quiv the Lazy Geek. He'll teach you all you need to know about how to use Nina. Pat wanting to know, will you be doing a live stream during galaxy season? I try to do every year and um, I will definitely try to do that soon, probably in March or April. Mahalt, uh, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, by the way. They're asking, why are there streaks in the nebula? That is a result of star trailing. I'm hoping this next frame fixes that. Sweet, the streaks went away. Those stars look nice and round. Last night, I actually took a two-panel mosaic of the Rosette Nebula because it doesn't quite fit in the field of view here for my camera. So I'm hoping to get to processing that soon. Uh, Johnny wanting to know what refractor would you be able to use to see the Eagle Nebula? And you can see them with any telescope. Uh, 60 millimeters I think would be sufficient. Cheryl wanting to know how big is this nebula? And it is a couple light years, a couple thousand light years across if I'm not mistaken.
Patriot Asto is another great YouTuber. His resources, his resources are absolutely fantastic. Correction on my previous statement, the Rosette Nebula is about 130 light years across, not a couple thousand. That's still a massive number. When you consider the size of the solar system, and you consider that the nearest star is about, what, like four and a half, four and a half light years away from the Earth, 140 light years across is phenomenally huge. Uh, David Scott wanting to know how many, have we discovered any new nebula and yes, I think we still are finding new nebula in our Milky Way from time to time. Very faint, diffuse nebula. A lot of these nebula are often on the other side of the Milky Way because we actually can't see nebula on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy because that's all obscured by the central region of the Milky Way. So we only have a vague idea on what's on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. We also don't really know the shape of our Milky Way galaxy very well. We have a good enough understanding to be able to say it's a barred spiral galaxy, or basically a spiral galaxy with like a bar in the middle of it, if you can visualize that. But we don't know like exactly what's on the other side of the nebula, or excuse me, of the Milky Way. Question saying, uh, can stock DSLRs be able to produce such images? Um, they are not, unfortunately, because stock DSLRs do not have great transmissibility of hydrogen alpha. So you would struggle to get this type of resolution with a stock DSLR. You would have to get a what's called hydrogen alpha mod or a full spectrum mod to be able to get a view like this through your camera. Question about what college would be the best to study this field? That's a great question. Um, University of Illinois, University of Florida are some two ones I can think of off the top of my head. Harvard, um, tons of options. Most colleges do offer some sort of astronomy or physics degree. I happen to have a physics background. Matthew asking, are you taking long exposure while the images are up or is this just a live view? I am taking long exposures. Michael wanted to know, will a 12-inch Dobsonian see anything like this? Unfortunately, I hate to um, let you down, but a 12-inch Dobsonian will not be able to see this much nebulosity. The reason for that is because I'm taking a long exposure, right? And as I take a long exposure, I'm increasing the amount of photons reaching the sensor over a longer period of time. As a result, my image ends up being a lot... Um, I end up capturing a lot more nebulosity than I would with just like the human eye and a telescope. But the human eye does have a much higher height dynamic range, so it's fantastic for looking at bright objects. And you can still see quite a bit with a Dobsonian telescope. The University of Backyard is another great choice, I suppose. University of Wikipedia, too. You can learn quite a bit on Wikipedia on the internet about astronomy in the nighttime sky. You don't necessarily have to uh, confine yourself to college to be able to learn more about the universe. One thing that's great about the modern advent of internet is that you can really learn anything you want to. Like Stephen Hawking's PhD thesis is on the internet if you want to look about it and learn more about some of his theories. We'll probably spend a few more minutes and then I actually have to think of something I want to go to next. I'm thinking the Christmas tree nebula. So we'll probably slew over to there next.
comment from Matthew that I really, really appreciate, and they say, thank you. I, for one, truly appreciate you sharing this with us. Um, astrophotography is something I'm very passionate about. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank you, Matthew, for taking the time to watch our little bit of our live stream. I appreciate you coming on board, and I appreciate hearing your feedback. It really does mean a lot to me. I really, really love sharing these views of astronomy uh, to you guys and talking to you guys about astronomy. It, uh, it really does make my night. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to pause this imaging sequence here. Let's go back to a full frame view. We're just going to end that. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna slew on over to the Christmas tree nebula. I believe that is NGC. Oops, I don't knock over my keyboard here. NGC 22644. We'll load an image here. framing a little better. I think that's pretty good right there. Try to get that bright star in the center. And then we'll just click slew and center. So again, we're just going to be doing plate solving like we have on the other nebula we viewed tonight. And this should take just about maybe five, 10 minutes. Oh, excuse me, not even five minutes, probably more like two minutes. That looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and start our exposures. We'll just let PHD2 settle for just a minute. And then we'll just take a two minute exposure. So this is a quite a bit of a fainter nebula than the ones we've looked at earlier, but it does vaguely look like a Christmas tree. It's not one I've actually photographed before or even shown on a live stream before, so I'm actually curious to see how this will turn out. Alex wanting to know how, why is the brightness that is on the right side of the image generated and how is it eliminated? Again, that is amp glow, and that can be eliminated by taking what's called a dark frame. A dark frame is basically where you put your a lens cap in front of your image train, take an exposure the same length you would as your light frames, and then using a program like Deep Sky Stacker or Pix Inside or whatever what program you want to use, and you can essentially subtract out that amp glow. Aaron wanted to know, can I do this kind of slewing with a Sky Adventure, which has no declination tracking? Um, I'm going to be honest, no. You're not going to be able to do it. You will be able to do some sort of limited auto guiding, but only in right ascension only. But you're not going to be able to do a slewing around like this. That's why you really need some sort of go-to uh, mount. Uh, Jellyfish W might also be a good one, I agree. 200 gain, yeah, uh, Alan. I think 200 gain is kind of the sweet spot here to get a brighter image considering my relatively low aperture. But if I go any further, I'm afraid I might end up with a lot of noise, especially as I'm not stacking. So that exposure should be finishing up. That didn't come out so great. You can kind of see it. So 
So this didn't come out quite as I was expecting. It is a very faint object and I am using quite a small telescope, but you're looking at a view of the Christmas tree nebula. New Star Adventure with GoTo coming out in May 2022. That is cool. Uh, Mark wanted to know, if we were to see a moving object in this image, what would it be? A comet? An asteroid? Yes. It would be that or a satellite. Definitely not a planet, though. But yeah, we're hoping this stream will be the first of many streams we have this year. We'll be doing streams next month, probably again for the next new moon. Um, I would like to do something with the Artemis 1 SLS launch in March or April. Then we have another solar or lunar eclipse coming up in May. And the idea being we'll keep the momentum going until we reach 2023 and 2024 when we get to live stream the solar eclipses there. So um, really hoping and uh, Really hoping I can get set up for that. That's in 2024. We'll have a live stream of the total solar eclipse then. Uh, Peter asking, is a Slashon CGM DX mount a go-to mount? Um, if I'm thinking of the mount correctly, I believe it is. So once again, if you're just tuning in, you're looking at a live view of the Cone Nebula, also known as the Christmas Tree Nebula. Uh, my name is Kyle, I'm with High Point Scientific, and we've been streaming for about an hour now, looking at some of the really cool deep sky objects, emission nebula that you can see in the nighttime sky. I'm using an Aperture 72 EDR telescope. And my cat just knocked something over, so give me a second. Sorry about that. But anyways, I'm using an Aperture 72 EDR telescope and the ZWO183MC Pro camera. If you've been enjoying this stream, I would appreciate if you shared this stream with your friends and your family. Get the word out. Get people excited about astronomy in the nighttime sky. Talking to you guys, getting people excited about astronomy is what I love to do. Alan asking, what time are you going to tonight? I'll probably be streaming for another 10 or 15 minutes here. Um, I actually have only a relatively narrow sort of field of view I can image through tonight because then if I go too long, it'll start going into the trees. And I'd also like to do some of my own imaging tonight. Okay, so we've looked at the uh, Christmas tree nebula for quite a bit. So let's see what else we can look at here. I'm just going to pull up Stellarium. Christmas 
this tree. Let's do the monkey head nebula. So what I'm going to do again is I'm just going to end that exposure. I'm going to go over to our framing tool and then I'm just going to type in the NGC number for the monkey head nebula. 2175 per stellarium. And we're just going to load an image from the HIPS2 Fit Sky Survey. And just to get a good idea of what our framing is going to be. And then we're just going to click slew and center. So this might take a little bit longer because the monkey head nebula is a little higher in the sky. Uh, California Nebula would be a good one, but I think it's behind the trees for me. I'm pretty much limited to anything in the eastern horizon tonight, unfortunately. Okay, we are centered. This one looks like it'd be a little bit brighter. So I make... Oh! One second. We're still plate solving. So this time, it doesn't look like my go-to was as accurate as my other one. So what it's going to do is try to solve to be able to center up the framing a little bit better. All right, that looks like it was a good solve. So what it's going to do now is going to tell PhD2 to go ahead and start guiding, give it a minute to settle, and then once it's done settling, I'll be able to take a two minute exposure. Just with a 10 second exposure, I could clearly see a little bit more than I was earlier. Alan saying they need to hit the hay. That's why I was asking, work early in the morning. Thank you so much, Alan, for checking in tonight. It was great to see you in the chat. Okay, so we're just going to take a two minute sub here and let that run for a minute. Uh, Mike wanted to know what I'll be shooting tonight. You know, I haven't decided yet because I've done the rosette recently. So maybe um, I've done Horsehead, I've done Orion, um, maybe this, Monkey Head Nebula. Blake and Sue saying, Thank you, I don't own a telescope, so I really enjoy these live streams. Well, thank you guys so much for checking in. It really means a lot to me to see you guys in the chat. David wanted to know, what was my first telescope? Oh, man. Oh, man, I got a story for you. Um, so my first telescope I actually used was a Mead a little mead refractor that my mother got for me from from a store I believe um, it was like a tiny 60 millimeter refractor and it was computerized but I had no idea how the computer worked and this was about 15 years ago I was about um, six or seven and um, I didn't know how the go-to worked. I didn't know how anything worked you know I'm just a kid out here with a little go-to telescope and I remember vividly pointing to a bright star. And then when I focused on that star, I saw the star had like lobes on the side. I was like, oh my goodness, that's not a star, that's Saturn. And any amateur astronomer can relate that feeling of excitement that you get when you see Saturn for the first time. It's just so inspirational. And from that moment on, I was just always excited about astronomy in the nighttime sky. Um, it wasn't until I was 19, though, that I bought a 8-inch Dobsonian, or my parents actually did for me for my 19th birthday. And um, I remember going outside and pointing it at a nebula. I think it was the Orion Nebula. And I just remember seeing the detail and the clarity in a Dobsonian. And just something that's not replicated by astrophotography is just the, like, the I don't know how to describe it, but like something about looking into an eyepiece will never 
like astrophotography will never be able to replicate that experience. It looks like that sub exposure has finished up. So I'll just full screen that. And this is a view of the monkey head nebula. Um, Mahal asking about the web images, if I'll be able to edit those. Um, I don't believe web has actually released any images yet, but I do know NASA put the Hubble Space Telescope images for free up on the internet for astrophotographers to edit. So if they do the same with James Webb, I will absolutely love the opportunity to edit some of those photos. Judy saying, first time for me tuning in. I love the stream. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for Judy for checking in. It's great to see you in the comments. <laughs> Scott saying, this looks a lot more fun than standing outside in the snow at negative 20 degrees Celsius with my telescope and DSLR. I can relate. Um, well, tonight's a cold night for Florida standards. It's 54 degrees. But the other night it was actually in the low 20s, which is really rare for Florida. And uh, But the cold is I've actually observed in was seven degrees Fahrenheit, so however many degrees that is in Celsius. Uh, David asking, are the gases basically the same in all nebula? And that's a great question, and the answer is no. Um, most nebula, emission nebula, for example, emit along what's called the H2 line the hydrogen, a, basically a region of ionized hydrogen, but you can actually observe nebula in different filters such as hydrogen alpha, uh, oxygen 3, and sulfur 2. And to answer your question, nebula are actually made up of many different gases. Um, when you think about it, the sun was actually born in the core of a nebula for 5 billion years ago. So you know, all the elements on Earth once came from a nebula, so um, to answer your question, there are tons and tons of uh, trace materials in nebula that um, make up our, you know, our solar system. But mostly nebula are made up of hydrogen and helium. A little bit of helium. Um, what portal scale am I using? I am uh, at portal 7 right now. Ed wanting to know, can you use these filters with a color camera? You can, but you wouldn't have as much success as you would with a monochrome filter, or excuse me, a monochrome camera. Uh, those filters being, you know, hydrogen, alpha, sulfur, and oxygen, you would have much better success with a monochrome camera. Willow saying, outer space is wild. The vastness blows my mind in the most humbling yet exciting way. I agree so much. Um, there's just something about the universe that just really, you know, I love learning about and I love seeing, you know, knowing that all of the elements that make us were once a part of a nebula five billion years ago that was born in the forged in the core of a star. Something about that is just absolutely fascinating to me. It's one of those reasons why I love to look up. David asking, do I subscribe to the Big Bang Theory? I accept it as scientific fact, so yes, I do. Vivian saying, thanks for tonight's stream. Thank you so much for checking in. Uh, Shannon saying, thanks for the lovely pictures and explanations. First time tuning in and we'll follow from now on. Well, thank you, Shannon, for checking in. It really means a lot for you to leave that positive feedback.
Alan saying it's 12 degrees in Connecticut? You. I assume you mean Fahrenheit. Kathy McCain saying, you are on the big screen TV for my family to watch. Thank you guys for the beautiful nebula shots. Well, shout out to the McCain family. Uh, thank you guys so much for checking in. I hope you guys are enjoying the live views of the Monkey Head Nebula. comment from phoenix go saying you've gained a new follower in me thanks kyle this is amazing and awesome well thank you so much really appreciate that david wanting to know what do you think about the new james webb space tel telescope compared to hubble well webb is obviously a, a transformational telescope you know this is a telescope with significantly more aperture than the hubble space telescope that can look further back into the edge of the universe than the hubble can um this being because James Webb is an infrared telescope where Hubble is a visible telescope. Visible light, I should say. So I'm really excited for the James Webb Space Telescope. You know, I've been tracking all of the deployment sequences and, uh, you know, obsessively following each and every update until it got to that Lagrange point. And I am so excited for the images James Webb will be producing here in a few months. I think that first test image will be coming in in what, four or five months from now, sometime in June. And I just can't wait for the new science and the new discoveries that James Webb Space Telescope will make.
Okay, so I think I have time tonight for one more shot of a nebula, and I think I'm going to choose, based on recommendations in the comments, the Jellyfish Nebula. So again, I'm going to take you with me through the process. I'm going to end this exposure, and I'm going to go over to framing. Stellarium says that is IC443, and then we're just going to load that image up. Try to get a decent framing on it. This one's pretty faint, so I'm not exactly sure how well it'll turn out. It looks really cool though. And then we're just going to click slew and center. The telescope again is going to slew on over to the jellyfish nebula and hopefully we get a good alignment. Okay, that was a good alignment, so we're just going to wait for the guiding to begin and PhD2 to start settling. And once that's done, we'll be clear to take our first two minute exposure. And we're exposing. Close that out. And this will probably be our last target for the night. David wanted to know, can any telescope see evidence of our presence on the moon? That is a great question. And the answer is no. Um, no ground paced telescope can really have that capability because of the atmosphere. You know, our atmosphere is not stable. It's fluid, it moves with respect to time. Because of that, that produces issues with seeing and transparency. So even on top of a mountain, that's impossible because the angular diameter of the flag on the moon, for example, is too small to be able to resolve within our atmosphere. Now, outside of our atmosphere, it's a different story. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope technically does have the resolving capability to be able to photograph the flag on the moon, but it cannot actually do so because of how overwhelmingly bright the moon is. So the only way we can actually um, photograph any evidence that we landed on the moon is through actually going to the moon with spacecraft and orbiting the moon and taking photos of it. And that's what exactly what NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbit Orbiter LRO has been doing since 2009. It's been orbiting the moon, taking incredibly high resolution images of the moon, and has photographed all of the Apollo uh, lunar landing sites. So that is a fantastic question, David. Mike, I'm interested in too in seeing what this will show. Uh, my opt, I am very, I'm not very optimistic because I'm using such a small telescope, but hopefully next telescope or next stream, I'll be able to use my Newtonian. So there you go. That's actually a lot more than I was expecting. Here is a view of the Jellyfish Nebula. This is a remnant of a supernova. Not too far away from the Monkey Head Nebula, and I believe this will be a good object to wrap up the night with. So we'll stay on this nebula for a few more minutes and I'll answer some more questions, but then we'll start packing it in for the night. Yeah, that came out a lot better than I was expecting. I was hardly expecting to see anything.
Uh, Scott says, I'm assuming that you are working wirelessly with your telescope. What range does wireless work from inside to outside equipment? Um, funny story, I'm actually connected through Wi-Fi, so what I'm using is a program called TeamViewer to be able to actually stream these views to you. And the telescope's actually set up about 20 miles away from where I'm live streaming right now. So, uh, pretty far, but I'm connected entirely through Wi-Fi right now. Emily says, great work. Thank you. Enjoyed this event very much. Well, thank you, Emily, so much for checking in. Okay, folks, on that note, uh, we've been streaming now for about an hour and a half. I think this is a good wrap-up point. Uh, we've seen just basically all the nebula that I think we can cover tonight with my telescope. It has been an absolute pleasure to talking to each and every one of you, an absolute joy. I'm so glad that you guys all tuned in. I hope you guys learned a thing or two about astronomy in the nighttime sky. Uh, remember, my name is Kyle. I'm with High Point Scientific. If you enjoy these streams, uh, feel free to like our channel on YouTube, uh, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and um, like our Facebook page. You know, the extra attention really helps us out and really helps us keep going with these streams. It's just great to be able to get the attention that we do. But again, until next time, the next live stream will probably be towards the end of February. My name is Kyle. I'm with High Point Scientific. And always remember to keep looking up. Thank you.